All I want to do is sleep. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I'm Kyle. And this is the Concept Crucible Podcast. And we survived Maker Expo 2016. We Woo! did. Woo! We did indeed. We were at Maker Expo 2016 uh, all day on Saturday. So that'll be Saturday, September 10th. And we were doing podcasts on site. And you can find those on our website. The link is in the show notes. We interviewed, we did 28 interviews. Mm. And we interviewed everybody from seven-year-old kids to uh, grandmothers to the mayors. Mm -hmm. It was a thing. Mm -hmm. It was a good time. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's what we're going to talk about today is our reflections on Maker Expo and uh, some of the feelings we came away, some of the things we saw there because it was incredible. Mm -hmm. But first, Icebreaker. Yeah, yesterday, one of the things that we were asking pretty much everybody was, even if they were or were not a maker, mm-hmm. if you had unlimited time, talent, treasure, skill, whatever you want to call it, but if you had just a carte blanche to do any project, build, make that you could do, what would you do? And so we should probably, in all fairness, ask ourselves that question. That seems reasonable. Yeah. So Kyle, I, you're our guest. Yeah. You go first. Sure. Um, currently, probably if I had unlimited time, unlimited money, one of the things I would do currently is crochet all the things with all the yarn. Um, <laughs> Jim is very familiar with Do you have anything specific that you'd like to crochet? I don't have any projects at the moment, but yarn is expensive. Fair. Um, very expensive. Um, and it would be nice to get some more crochet hooks because one can never have too many. Um, but yeah, um, so crochet. Another thing if, for in terms of time and equipment, if I could get all that would be video making right now. Mm-hmm. Um, that is something that I wish to start. So nice, Huck. How about you? It's your big your big dream build. Um, well, I mean, I wish I could go with the, the robot one, because all the kids yesterday seemed to all, all want to build robots. Well, there were robots fighting out front of the building. Yeah, I know, but they just were all over the robots. We were also next to the build-your-own-robot activity. Yeah, there was that, too. And that was super cool. Uh, let's see. Um, I don't know. I'm shooting a little low with the idea of, like, building my own computer from scratch, but I think I'd, 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 st- I'd want to start there. Uh, Trust just, me when I tell you, that can get pretty expensive. Yeah, so, and I, like, you, the computer that I bought off of you was built from scratch, you know, it's... Mm-hmm. No, I, no, you, I, I bought, bought that one. Oh, like, complete? Yep, I was lazy. Well, in it. that case, never mind. Uh, so, I mean, and the reason why I, I bought Jim's computer is started with a conversation that I wanted to build my own, but I don't have the expertise, and he's like, I have a computer, you can just... I have a lot of computers. Yeah, so... Uh, so I, I would probably start there, but uh, if I wanted to build up from there, um, I, I follow a lot of life hacker stuff, and they, they do a lot of really interesting conversations on um, designing your own like home workspace and whatnot. And I think I'd like to get into that. I, like I helped Jim move his workspace around, and I like the idea of like it's not just a computer; it's computer entertainment peripherals. Um, having it set up to suit your needs. And I think I wouldn't mind doing something like that, like setting up my apartment to have a computer space, but also have it tie in with the entertainment system so I could mm-hmm. just watch videos from my computer but on my television and play games and whatnot. Just have it all integrated into a system that yeah. made sense and, and whatnot. So I think I'd probably do that. I'd probably start small and then eventually build my own Megazord. Remind me to tell you about Raspberry Pi media servers. Yes, yes. Uh, that is something, that is like on my long-term to-do list, things that I want to learn how to do and implement in my life. Cool. Uh, I guess it's my turn, Chip. Uh, I have a lot of stuff that I want to want to do, but uh, this morning I watched the, the PAX West uh, 2016 D&D game and one of the things that I have been trying to sort of I've been nosing around for a while since we did the, the D&D live stream for a couple of years is D&D is performance art mm-hmm. and D&D is performance art for, for Penny Arcade means not just players and dice and a stage but costumes sets big huge 
um, pieces, like set piece set pieces for battles and things like that. And like some of the stuff they have come out with is just incredible. And I have some of the facilities to do that. I'm part of Quartz Lab. I have access to a laser cutter and 3D printers and a big heavy lab. And mm -hmm. I maybe even have the time to do it. Like I can make time to do it. Uh, my big thing that holds me back, apart from, I guess, time and budget, is uh, where do I put it after we use it? Yeah, storage, long-term storage seems to be an issue. I mean... We when we did the when we did a we did a fourteen player mashup game and they fought a huge skeletal dragon which uh, Eric Moon painted mm -hmm. and it was incredible and I loved it and now that thing is sitting in my office because I can't really use it for D and D again for a while mm -hmm. and it's just sort of I don't really have room for it in my apartment right now. And I'm like, I could build more things and they'd be really cool, but at the same time like Jim, where do you put them when you're done with them? Or how do you, how do I, and the question of how do I build them in a way that's like modular and reusable is a much larger design question mm -hmm. that I have, I do not have enough time for, nor enough talent. Mm -hmm. So I would love to design more like innovative D&D &D stuff and, and, and especially with the idea of building it into a real like show like we did pod yesterday we were podcasting as performance art and it was really fun but D, D performances that's that's my dream project i have two follow-up questions on your dream <laughs> or not follow -up. great one, one, i'm really looking forward to those <laughs> one, one, one one's uh, a point of information and the other one is perhaps a suggestion i'll start with the suggestion first business idea um renting out miniatures like really unique miniatures for D&D &D, like one time D&D &D use and then you may like easily you remind say, me to tell you about <laughs> nights at the dinner table where one of the characters does that and, yeah. it's, and it's not super great but um but the, 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 the answer the answer is uh the market for that is very small i know but it's very it's weird war, it's worldwide we need to just get really cheap shipping and then, oh, actually you know at that point it's just you might as well like <laughs> 3d print your own uh, monsters and then yes. recycle it uh point of information uh i'm not entirely clear on the distinction say between uh D &D as performance art and larping so how how do those oh okay. what, what's, that, um, what's the so, difference of that uh, remind me to also send you the link to the pax D, &D games sure and maybe so, we can link it in the show notes oh totally totally interested. uh 2016 will be in there they just put it out i think a couple days ago mm. and i finally had time because uh, i wasn't prepping for maker expo to watch it mm. and so what they do is, is so larping you act out your character and you walk around and you interact with people uh, whether you're doing vampire larping um in which case you do like rock paper scissors or boffer larping where you hit people with foam swords and things like that they're both fun and they're a good time mm -hmm. um what they do on uh, at say pax or on a show like role play is they play Dungeons & Dragons or some other art, tabletop role-playing game. And what you are there to watch, you are not there to play when you sit in the audience. I was at the PAX East game when I was there. And what you are there to do is watch people play Dungeons & Dragons. Okay. And it is hilarious and wonderful. Okay. Uh, I you it, it's super dorky. Okay. Like, have you seen uh, Geek and Sundry? Yeah, Geek and Sundry has a uh, critical role. Okay. Um, JP McDowell's runs role play, and they've been doing that for a long time. And then Pax has been doing. They started as a podcast. Okay. And then they do live D and D. Okay. I'll have to check it out then. Yeah. Because Link, links to all this stuff in the show notes because I think it's really cool, even though I'm a super nerd. <laughs> But we're not here to talk about Jim's D and D dreams. We're here to talk about Maker yeah. Expo. Yes. So Maker Expo is an uh, an event. It's a local event here in Kitchener Waterloo, and it's in its second year. Uh, last year, I think they they had about seventy five hundred people through, mm -hmm. uh, possibly more. Uh, obviously, links in the show notes. And it is an event that showcases and celebrates makers in the community. Mm -hmm. And 
Of course, the follow-up question is, what is it? Who, who or what is a maker? And the answer is, we are all makers. Mm-hmm. Um, that is that is their ultimate message. Is everybody has something that they make or they want to make or they do, whether it's music or a great community mm-hmm. or three D printers or you name it. So we had everyone there from. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and like that's one of the greatest messages about Maker Expo is that a lot of people, when you say, oh, like, uh, what, what's your hobby in terms of creating things? A lot of people think of the traditional things, like, mm-hmm. do I crochet? You know, do I uh, do crochet? Cra- is definitely right. Yeah, do I craft? Um, do, I, do I make something physical? Uh, and it's a lot more than that. Like uh, you, you're you're a maker if you make music. Uh, you're a maker if you podcast. Um, Arguably, yes. <laughs> um, you're a maker if you are a coder, which was a, a yes. big thing. Uh, Hive Water, the region was there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there were there was uh, who else did we interview that morning? Uh, the Canadian Association for Girls in Science, mm-hmm. uh, which promotes uh, uh, and and tries to give workshops for, for girls. Uh, to interest them in STEM, yeah, and like that's the interesting one from yesterday, and and how they were there um, in an exhibitor space. They weren't there as the traditional maker because they weren't there to showcase a project. They were there to discuss a cause. And, I would argue and, that they are they are you know shepherding a a next generation of makers. Yeah, it's and only, they also brought a fun maker project. Yeah, and so it's like a support for fostering makers. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of people there, I think, that, that, that support or foster makers in addition mm-hmm. to being there. I mean, we interviewed uh, Ig Kalenko. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's a director at... Um, the uh, Center for Smart Manufacturing at Comstock yeah. College. So, I mean, the answer is we are all makers, and Maker Expo definitely shows that to be true i mean we there were hundreds a hundred and i forget how many exhibits i really should have looked that up Mm -hmm. but and it was everything from the giant water breathing balloon dragon like gouts of water from his mouth uh kaloth the water dragon amazing made, (laughs) made entirely from balloons uh thanks to drew ripley and you know in the front to uh, bot brawl and their robot fights mm-hmm. to the cardboard kingdom that was in the art gallery mm-hmm. to Artemis. Um, there was a crew. The the KW Artemis crew was running Artemis all day in uh, just down just down the hall from us actually. Mm-hmm. Like there were tons and tons of activities. There were tons and tons of uh, things for people to do. Things for people to see, and it's free, mm-hmm. and it's huge, and it's fun. So, I mean, obviously, we're going to link to Maker Expo. You can see all the exhibits uh, that were run there. Uh, you can listen to our interviews, uh, which are also in the show notes. But it was a really incredible time. I remarked, I think it wound up in one of the notes, that one of the marks of being an adult is getting really happy when you see kids, like, enjoying learning. Like, as a kid, you don't really sort of care. As a teenager, you don't, you really sort of don't care about anything. But... As an adult, when you see a seven-year-old who is, like, super enthused with this thing that they just made, that they run up to their parents and they're like, look what I just did! And they're like, rock. You just want to, like, fist bump them. Well, like, what was uh, one of the kids uh, said a really poignant quote that stood out for you? <laughs> it was, uh, that was Caden. Um, his interview's in the, show, in the show notes, too. And he was, it was... Uh, we asked him, we're like, what's the greatest thing you've seen here today? And he's like, everything here is the greatest thing I have ever seen. And it just, it just hit me. He was tapping into, into universal truths. He was <laughs> dropping some truth bombs all over the place. Yes. We did not actually see very much. No. Um, we were... So what we were doing there was, Ryan and I were running interviews. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we were, we had a bunch of scheduled interviews and we were just pulling people out of the crowd to talk about uh, what they want to make. And their experiences at Maker Expo and the incredible stuff that they've seen. Um, Kyle was running our booth when we were doing that. <laughs> um, and we could not have done that without you. <laughs> because otherwise you don't get to go to the bathroom. 
Um, I also had to run uh, all of our on-site sound engineering. And then Rich, who is not here, um, was our who continues to be off-site, mm. uh, was responsible for actually putting up all the posts on our website and making sure that um, from time of recording to people's interview going live on our site, the turnaround time was about five minutes. Yeah, it and was, it was just, incredibly quick. It's it it so shocked good. people. Like, yeah, they're, they're still standing there yeah. sometimes. And we're like, oh, your interview is up. Like, mm-hmm. It's not going to take a week? No, it's done. <laughs> I don't have a week for this. You don't have a week to wait. It's done now. Mm. So by the time we finished, we were there from all, the, all day from 10 till 6. And by the time we finished, all of our interviews were already up online. They had already been tweeted out on the Maker Espo hashtag. We made sure to send them out to... Uh, anybody who gave us their contact information for, for their interviews, it was all done. Mm-hmm. Which, let me tell you, it be, as, as somebody who goes to well, who was part of a lot of events, it feels really good. Mm-hmm. No, no home or work to take home with you. A little bit of work to take home with me, yeah. but only a little bit. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, what were some of your cool takeaways from Maker Expo? Um, like in terms of the themes that we saw yesterday? Sure. Yeah, I noticed I noticed three themes, and we can perhaps discuss just discuss each of them in turn. But um, the first one uh, started before we even got there. It was when we were trying to figure out the public facing brand of the channel, um, mm-hmm. because at some point we needed to, and this was by some point. I mean, when we the day of the the um, applications being due, Jim's pounding a you know messaging to send to the to send to the organizers to convince them to let us come out and set up shop. Yep. And Jim came up with a really interesting tagline. I'm not sure where it came from originally, but the tagline was, we make each other brave on the internet. Oh, do you not know that story? Uh, you might have said it in the in even one of the podcasts. But. So, um, the very first open mic that Kaylee and I played together, that was how I introduced us, mm. which was... Um, we are Wootsu Riot, we make each other brave on the internet, and sometimes also in person. Mm. And since doing that, that was about a year ago, almost two years ago, um, since doing that, that is every time somebody asks me, or every time I go and play something live, like that is my my one sentence introduction, is we, we make each other brave. Mm. All the podcasts, all the videos... All the blog posts, whatever, that's incidental to what we actually do. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a theme that popped up beforehand, but it seemed to pop up quite a bit uh, at the expo when we started interviewing people. I mean, obviously, uh, once we told them it was an audio-only broadcast, um, it was very easy for them to, to agree to that. They were very, or their, their level of self-consciousness went down, self, or self-critical uh, mm-hmm. levels went down. Um, but they they became brave in that sense to, to come on out and talk to strangers uh, and get the opportunity to talk about or gush about things that were very passionate to them. Um, so that was one interesting theme. I don't know if anybody has any follow-up comments on that. Um, the one thing that I noticed was, especially with parents, when when they would ask, they're like, you know, because we, we had our trailer running, and you can find our trailer in the show notes too. You can also find it if you go to our YouTube channel. And their kids would come over and they would see our trailer and there's some really cool things in it. And they'd be like, what do you do? And I would tell them, I'm like, we make each other brave. And they would sort of stop and think about it for a minute. And they would look and I would be like, and we make videos and things. And they'd be like, oh, okay. And then they would sort of get it. Like we're, we're big dudes. We're here waving around microphones and doing a thing, and the very first thing that we tell them is we just admit that we are scared. Like, in order to do anything, we have to admit that we are scared of it and that we are okay with that. Like, it is okay to be scared. It is okay to be nervous. Um, and that is the that was the big thing I found doing interviews is that people are like, well, I'm really nervous. I'm like, that, that is, like, we are trying to create, we're not we're not creating a space where we just make podcasts. We're trying to create a space where you feel safe to talk about whatever you need to say. Mm-hmm. And going forward, I think that's definitely something, if we do more public events, that I want to build on. 
one of the first interviews we did yesterday, or the second interview, after we wrapped up, she commented, she's like, that was a lot easier than I thought it was. Good. Yeah, so... Yeah, and like there was a, there was a one mo- uh, mother um, with uh, with her son there, uh, and when she asked, you know, what do you guys do? And I explained about being brave. Uh, she was all, uh, so like she immediately pointed to her son. And she goes, "Yeah, my son wants to do videos, and he wants to. He does a lot of music." Uh, and so she got really excited and uh, really enthusiastic about it and kept asking me a lot of questions about it. And was like, yeah, my son, this is exactly what my son wants to do. Uh, and she, she was really trying to push him to do an interview. He didn't ultimately because he was a little bit too afraid at the time. But, next time. Uh, exactly, next time. And, and she looked really happy that we were there to sort of show her son that, hey, you know, people are afraid, but, you know, you can... You can do this, and you can have fun and be successful. Wow! Well, and let, let's well, let's bracket the success. Yeah. Well, but. no, but like even even going to Maker Expo <laughs> or any expo and like putting yourself out there, I would say, is a personal success. Yeah, like, mm-hmm. you don't have to define success as something. You know, I uh, I'm intrigued to to maybe go back next year and see if we we get some of the same people. Yeah, I was thinking that as well. Yeah, one but. year later. I think it's it's one of those things that it gets pretty it, it 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 is hard to, or it is easy to see a whole bunch of people doing really cool stuff, and think, well, I could never do that. Um, because they are cooler, they are smarter, they are braver, they are they are doing all these things, and I definitely have those thoughts, all the time. <laughs> but it is equally interesting, I think, to talk with people and and be vulnerable and let them know that yeah this is this is like we've never done this before we're making it up as we go we have a plan but it, plans change and plans had to change several times that day mm-hmm. but I mean we are we are overcoming fear to do this we are not without fear mm-hmm. or without trepidation and that I think is is important uh, one of the other things that you found, Huck, was the, the sort of the maker incentive to like, or, or drive to make vision into reality. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the things that helped to open up the the definition of maker to be a little bit more inclusive of things that are not traditionally thought of as making. Mm-hmm. Which is why, like, when I had my friend come in, who she's getting a business off the ground, but making as expressed through health and fitness. Yep. Um, normally that's just considered a service, but in some sense, and this is like the philosophy nerd in me talking about the artisan and the technician in terms of, you know, having a skill set that creates an object and you can account for the creation of it, you know, and you can teach it to others and, and whatnot. So when we, when I asked her if she wanted to be a part of it, you know, I said, let's, let's try to have an interesting conversation about things that are not traditionally thought of as maker, like Mm -hmm. crochet knitting or or building electronics. Um, And so that was an interesting idea that, you know, when you start with uh, with a a vision or just a general idea in your head and then you try to figure out, okay, how do I take this idea, take it out, and make it make it manifest in reality. And everybody there, that was what they were trying to do, you know, to varying degrees of, I say success in this in the sense of how well does it gel with the vision you have in your head. Mm-hmm. You know, you know everything from kids painting miniatures to um, soldering to the cool little name tags with the LED lights that showed invisible ink. Mm-hmm. You know, there's all sorts of really really neat things. Or uh, Hive Waterloo, or Re- or Waterloo Region with uh, designing an app on paper with click throughs and everything. Yeah, I mean, there's just there everything seemed to be centered around this idea. If you have an idea, now let's try to turn it into something. One well, and, and from a practical perspective. That is the best way to do it, I find, is, you know, the, the, the joke I always tell is I can, I can write any song in half an hour. Mm. Um, it'll just be garbage. Like, mm. like, the first set of chords and lyrics I write down will be trash, but I need to know how... Knowing that they're trash means I know how they're wrong, mm. and I can work to correct it. Like, you're, it's, it's iterative design. Mm. Um, so... I think one of the other things we, we, we saw, we and uh, the Cambridge City Councilor, Jan, Jan, Councilor Jan Liggett, talked about it when she, she 
Because she's also a maker yeah. as a career. Yeah. In addition to being a politician. And for her, uh, like, like part of it is also like not, not fearing mistakes or not fearing failure. Um, and at the same, in the same, in the same sort of token is trying to ensure that, uh, those kinds of failures and those kinds of risks are mitigated. Like it's, you know, it's, it's half of, half of not fearing failure is making sure you're not betting anything you can't afford to lose. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's easy to just make a blanket statement of don't be afraid of failure, but I mean, Sometimes be afraid of failure. <laughs> mm -hmm. One of the biggest things about um, fearing failure um, also comes around the idea of perfection and whatnot. I can't start until I have the perfect idea or the perfect thing. Uh, never mind the idea. I mean, that's how you started your channel in terms of just <laughs> put something out there and then your goal should be to be at least 1% better every time Ooh, you Ryan, it. please stop making me link to my first YouTube video. Okay, you can describe <laughs> it. Don't link to no, it. No, it's I'm going to all link to it. It's okay. awful. It's Yeah, but well, you told that story yesterday too to make a point that it's not about having a very nicely polished, well, evenly lit stage <laughs> to film on. Uh, it's not about having a master's thesis that you know start to finish what it's going to be. It's about you know writing a chapter at a time. It's about putting out a video, reflecting on it, learning, yep. and then figuring out what you want to do next time. Like, oh, I really like this, but next time I'm going to do this, or I'm going to try this, or I'm going to say this. I mean, I actually ran into that with my co my class. Like, I taught a class Friday, so a couple of days ago as of oh, filming. Oh, yeah. You taught your very first I taught my very first class. Philosophy class. And I, and I haven't written down in a, in a formalized, systematic way, but I've already started reflecting on... Um, obviously there are things that I'm going to be critical about, but there are, but it went well. It's just, there are things I'm going to be, I'm going to be critical about. I'm going to take those self criticisms. Like, okay, how can I do better next time? Mm -hmm. You know, like f my biggest thing is verbal diarrhea. I get really excited and I just launch words. I'm aware. And I need to learn to slow down, be more measured and, and it'll, it'll come across better. So that's the one thing I need to do for next week. <laughs> did you find any cool themes at uh, Maker Expo? You got, a ch uh, I think, a bit more of a chance to walk around than we did. But only a bit. Um, I was just... Uh, it, was, it was so awesome to see so, like, such a diverse amount of creativity. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there were things that I... I I never would have thought of like the it was right beside us like the the felt um, the the felt making the where, wet felting yeah. yeah wet felting I had never heard of wet felting before like it, and it's like basically or from what I saw I didn't look at it very much uh, but like a lot of people were putting felt in wa like soapy water and then making things from it like little tiny like uh, not teddies but like figurines I suppose. Yep. Uh, it was really cool. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I guess just like the sort of the, the the vast diversity we saw of people making things that it was really inspiring to see that. Yeah, it's. I think it's one of those things where with a really great event, you always come away for the next like two or three days at least. You're like super motivated. Oh yeah, no, definitely. <laughs> like today too. Yeah. You're like now I need to do these things. I yeah. know what I need to do. Mm -hmm. Like even like when I came home yesterday, like there there's a few crochet projects that I have been getting a little bored with, but I, I got home and I was like I was I just continued them. You skipped was... the after party so you could crochet. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is definitely a somebody who is motivated and inspired. That. Yeah, it's it was really cool leading up to it too. I was at the lab, and I saw people working. I got to talk with people who were working on their projects. Um, whether it was the harmonograph or the robot dog or um, Ravi's pile of bot brawl robots. But seriously, they were fighting robots all day. Mm -hmm. Oh, shout out for somebody making something, Gina, with our yes. sign and... Special thanks to Gina, yeah. uh, who made us uh, cards to give away and uh, a lovely banner that will make appearances at other events. Yeah. So, again, another... <laughs> we don't usually exist in physical space. Yeah, another unseen hero to help make yesterday a success for us. 
So next steps. Mm. Um, I am not in a position to say what the next steps are from for Maker Expo, but I know a little bird told me that of course their plan is uh, they start planning in a couple of months, um, and they uh, they are of course going to come back bigger and better, and uh, like this was the first year they had paid installations, so mm -hmm. I think it was eighteen or nineteen mm -hmm. uh, installations that their incredibly gracious sponsors, places like the City of Kitchener and the University of Waterloo and a whole list that's on their sponsors page, mm -hmm. um, put together. And they, they, they were able to pay artists for their time, for the materials, and that was everything from Kaloth the Water Dragon to the uh, Wargaming Tradecraft uh, mini painting workshop mm -hmm. to... Stamp making. Stamp making that yeah. was right across from us. I really wish I could have sat down and made... That. Yeah. If I had a yeah. crest, I would probably do that, but I, I don't have a crest, so I didn't have any idea of what Remind I Remind me to tell you that we can laser cut stamps later. Yeah, I know, <laughs> but I, I wanted to cut it there. Mm -hmm. Well, you had to run the booth. So. I know. I went there. I went to Maker Expo last year with my grandmother. Nice. I took her around. Yeah. I didn't make it last year. I was at the Ren Fair. Oh, yeah. How what was it like with your grandmother? It was good. I mean, um, you know, she's she's a maker in the old school sense of like she cooks and does the the home economic stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of the high, making. Yeah, so Don't a, a lot of the high tech stuff wasn't like she she thought it was interesting. She thought it was cool, but you know it was, it was more of a walk around. Like I was the one who wanted to stop at every booth and do stuff, which is usually what Sarah hates about me and libraries and or libraries and museums. You know, I'm the, the person who stops at each individual thing. So with my grandmother, that has a lot of people and, you know, high tech <laughs> stuff. She wasn't as interested in it, but uh, she enjoyed it. She certainly, as long as we were out of the rain, she was fine. Because <laughs> it was a downpour last year. Yes, the weather the weather was much nicer mm -hmm. yesterday. It was mm -hmm. great. Uh, but no, so, so I know the next steps for Maker Expo are bigger, better, mm -hmm. um, you know, onward and upward. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the next steps making-wise for each of you? Well, I do have. Uh, maybe I should put it into a pod, like into the podcast, as a commitment for us Ooh. that we need to do. No, we as like podcasting need to oh. do. There's a few Your things. Life. No, no. There's a few things that we need to figure out uh, to make our channel better. One of them was accessibility. Yes, making making our podcast more accessible um, because there was a gentleman there. I think he was an aide to Mary uh, to Mary to Barry Veranovic because um, he was he was either an aide or a friend, but he was mm -hmm. hanging around with Barry. And he pointed out to us, I believe he was a deaf gentleman, I didn't ask him specifically, um, but he co was communicating with me and he pointed out that there was no way for him to appear on our uh, on our podcast as it existed. Yep. That's and a good so, point. And that's, that, I thought that was a very good point. Uh, point well taken that it's something we could try to do in the our, future. Up our accessibility and that's a thing that we, we have actually been sort of quietly working on yeah. uh, in the background. Mm -hmm. I just didn't want to brag about it until we were actually done. Yeah, no, it, it'll be. We can certainly brag about it once it's in place. But, um, but I mean, that's uh, like iterative learning. We we we're learning the areas that we need to we need to look at in the future and figure out. So, yep. Uh, so that that was us for a channel. So part of our so our next steps as a channel, one of the one of the big ones is um, not just more content and cooler content, but more accessible content, definitely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, what about for you personally as a so as for, a maker? So for me personally, um, now that Maker Expo is done, um, I need to focus on making my class stuff, like making an environment, a learning environment for my students. Um, I'm teaching a crop of students in which none of them are, well, some of them might be arts students, but for the most part, none of them are humanities majors. It's all students taking a general education course. Um, so I have to make philosophy accessible to them Ooh. and accessible in a broader sense. My goal is to take the, the analytical philosophical terms, pluck them out of the clouds and make them something that they want to care about. And I think I started well with the first class and s some of my plans moving forward. Um, but that's something I have to be mindful of. So that's, that's my focus right now from now until I think December 16th is when they write their final exam. Stay tuned for my guest lecture in Ryan's class where all I do is a um, Bernard Black impression for three hours while juggling in, in an Albert, <laughs> and then I claim it, and then I claim it's continental philosophy. <laughs> uh, but then personally, uh, a project that I want to do, I wanted to do it this summer just after Scotland, but I went back to work two weeks early. Um, I do have a project that I want to make. Um, 
a smart mirror, I guess, mounting a computer monitor attached to like a Raspberry Pi that displays information from online. Ooh. Um, that's that's like a thing I want to make, and uh, I found a like make.com. Somebody made a tutorial of the one that they made, so I want to try to make one of my own and teach myself, you know, skills about programming and whatnot. Um, so that's I'm not sure when I'll get to that. I don't have a lot of free time at the moment, so uh, those are mine. How about you, Kyle? Um, start making videos. Ooh. Yeah, definitely one. Welcome to uh, the dark side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been, like, thinking of ideas and wanting to do videos for several years now. Like, uh, and I, like I've told, I'd even told Jim several years ago, like, yeah, I, I, I should start doing videos. And then I, it never happened. I blame myself. We, we, <laughs> we were living together when <laughs> I think I first started making videos. We are pretty, mm -hmm. pretty close around then, yeah. And you were like, yeah, this seems cool. No, but yeah, I mean, you were supportive and you were like, yeah, you should do it. Yeah. So, like, you were definitely there um, for, for for being a supportive friend. But, like, that's a, it's not on me. It's not on you. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but, like, I, like I, went to, I studied abroad. That would have been an amazing thing to capture on video, like, even just for my, my own sort of memories as well. And... I didn't do that. Now I'm thinking, you know, I, I should have, but of course now it's too late. So uh, I, I want to start making videos and yeah. Nice. All right, what do you want to make videos about? That is what I'm still sort of thinking about. Um, even if it's, uh, you know, daily or once in a while vlogs, um, but also about history, uh, like the Hellenistic period. Um, we we studied classics, Jim and I. Yep. Um, so uh, it, it's a really interesting period. There's there's so much to say about the Hellenistic period, and like there's some stuff on uh, like on YouTube, for example. But it would be so interesting to to talk about a lot of the stuff uh, that that went on in the Hellenistic period. Um, and that's way more that's way more involved than YouTube baking show. <laughs> yeah, also YouTube baking show. That Seriously, would be cool. dude, you're, <laughs> you're a food wizard. Link to the baking episode <laughs> below, where Kyle expresses the fact and proves that he is a food wizard. <laughs> oh, I am not a food wizard. How about you, Jim? What's your? Do you have any projects, like not channel projects, but 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 actual like personal projects? Yeah. I had an answer for this in the pre-show, and I have completely forgotten what it was. You didn't mention music. No, um, I do want to make more music, and make more music in a more rigorous fashion. And having more space will allow me to do that, and also having sort of parceled out time. Uh, I've got some small events that I want to put together. Um, I'm part of Quartz Lab, so I'm kind of working on putting together a Quartz Lab jam night based on some of the jam nights we went to in Scotland, mm -hmm. which were incredible. Mm -hmm. Like when you when you have a jam night that's so inclusive that you can include someone who's been playing mandolin or violin for 60 years and somebody who you know started playing guitar two months ago that is that is the kind of music playing like community music playing that i want to that i want to do mm -hmm. um apparently i sent an email back home to the guys i because I, I think i picture sent a picture or maybe a short video clip and i said we need more of this in canada and my one buddy's like yeah that happens in the east coast oh yeah no it's it's <laughs> we, super, we need to bring it west super east coast thing yeah yeah <laughs> it ha no you can there, there's there, it happens in town too there's there's folk jams and stuff mm -hmm. but um i'm not i'm not super part of the, of the folk music scene here so mm -hmm. i'll spoilers kitchener has a really big folk music scene uh southern ontario has a really big folk music scene but uh no, on, on, on top of that, uh, I want to do some D&D &D events, like D&D uh, &D socials, and I want to run some more one-shot games, um, partly because it's fun, partly because, you know, it's fun to do consequence-free things. And I also, I've been w working on sort of putting together just like a little pub social mm -hmm. for GMs that I know, which includes everybody from a guy that I work with, to some of the people who play with me, to my 11-year-old niece who runs a game at school, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, But it's just this little tiny stuff. Um, I do want to take the time to focus on my D&D &D games more. I mean, that was the one thing that got really neglected 
coming up to Maker Expo, and I want to uh, step up my game a bit for that. And happily, the studio re- reorganization that we did has uh, has definitely helped that out. Mm-hmm. So I have some like, like I think I think what's next for me is is some rest and some small stuff while I think of the next big thing, mm-hmm. um, which is maybe summer lights. Mm. We'll talk. We have to have a we have to have an actual channel meeting before we go on for that. But shout outs. Thank you so much to all of the organizers mm-hmm. of Maker Expo. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had uh, several of them stop by for interviews, mm-hmm. both scheduled and impromptu, and they were incredible. They were obviously the people who um, allowed us to come and do our weird, weird thing mm-hmm. where we set up a fake living room with a fake couch and a rug and invited people into our space to talk about their experiences. Mm-hmm. Uh, the volunteers at Maker Expo who were super supportive. Oh, they were awesome. We mm-hmm. Always had we, we always had anything we needed, uh, and we always had people checking in on us. Mm-hmm. Like, we tried to be really self sufficient because I know that those events can be really taxing on volunteers. Mm-hmm. But even to the point where I think we you, we had just you had just come back from the lunch run call. Right. Yes, I did. Because yeah. we 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 did a lunch run and then. They came by and they're like, "We have sandwiches." Yeah. <laughs> Where were you like thirty minutes ago? <laughs> <laughs> and like they're even vegetarian. I'm like, "Oh my god, you guys yeah. are amazing." Uh, thank you to uh, like also all of the other exhibitors, especially the ones who came, who came and interviewed. And again, link links to link. I'll just put the link to our mammoth interview post mm-hmm. in the show notes because mm-hmm. uh, they were a lot of fun and they were willing to. They had no idea what they were getting into. Like, the amount of prep that anybody got for their interview Mm -hmm. was maybe 30 seconds. No. It was, Huck tells you how to hold the microphone Mm -hmm. and the kinds of questions we're going to ask. I snap my fingers three times and then we go. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there was there was some vague dream I had of of maybe sending them the prep questions ahead of time, but no, the, like having no. Maker Ex- Expo fall in the same week as the first week of classes no. <laughs> and work and everything else. It was more fun to do it off the cuff, and it was yeah, and, and there were troopers. I didn't have, I, we didn't have a single person asked to start over. We didn't have. Yeah. I mean, we could have, and we would have if they if they had. Yeah, but yeah, like they just they just ran with it. And I I, w- I would like to credit in part that to uh, hopefully our, our space sort of making them feel comfortable yeah and making making it easy to talk about the things that matter to them and just to in case you don't fully appreciate why we're so happy with how this turned out especially like in the context of the mayors the mayors didn't know what they were getting themselves yes. into <laughs> they were they knew that they were being interviewed but. And it was probably going to be about Maker Expo, but the fact that the mayors and then everybody else trusted us to come in and say yes, I'll speak on the record about things, and it won't be in any way something that'll make me feel uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. Like all the people that we interviewed, and all the people we spoke to, like they had, we engendered enough trust in them off the off the cuff that they were willing to take a shot on our little expo or our, our little exhibit. Yeah. So I mean, like that. That's why we're so appreciative of all these people. Is they they walked in blind, and everybody seemed to be very happy walking away of what they what they participated in. It was re- it was really exciting, mm-hmm. and then at the, by the end of the day, I was just really tired. Yeah. Yeah. We were super tired. <laughs> but no, everybody made it such a such an incredible event. I mean, with the artwork. 3D printing projects. The we had the the guys in from CNC mm, yeah. who had a, uh, a a milling machine. Mm-hmm. It's like it's all the stuff you never think about. There's a harmonograph there. Yeah. And we live in a small town. Mm-hmm. I mean, ish. Uh, also, special thanks. You mentioned Gina, mm-hmm. and also thanks to Kyle for helping us out, and Rich, who was awesome. uh, off site all day. Uh, uploading our posts and playing World of Warcraft. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ravi for setting up the interview with the mayors. Yep. And uh, Cam for coming by and, and being super, super cool. Cam also was the one who found our space, showed me around it. Like Working with him before the event was really great. Mm-hmm. And I am excited to 
apply for next year's. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we will not see you next year. We will see you in two weeks uh, with a new podcast. We will see you uh, tomorrow with Minecraft videos. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm Jim. I'm Ryan. I'm Kyle. And we're signing off. Never stop making. I like that one. Let's. It's no stay awesome, but it'll do. <laughs>